Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Pete, and I'm in Hispanic Studies. Uh, now, if I was to say the country name Colombia to you, without any doubt at all, the first words you're going to be thinking of are drugs, cocaine, violence, Pablo Escobar. Probably right, yeah? I mean, to be fair, that's the words that I thought of when the path towards my PhD started when I was 12. And in August, <laughs> I, was a, I was a kid of the world. But in, uh, in August 1989, my family moved out to Cali, Colombia. Now, this wasn't the best time to visit Colombia. At this point, it was known as the most dangerous nation in the world. Pablo Escobar was at the height of his uh, notoriety and powers. And in fact, three days before we arrived in Cali, uh, the henchman of Pablo Escobar had shot the uh, favourite for the Colombian presidency, Luis Carlos Galán. Uh, the country rioted, and we saw the aftermath of this as we drove from the airport to our hotel that evening. And a few of the images that, that stayed really permanently in my mind were the sight of a bus that had been completely overturned and burnt out, the sight of shop windows completely destroyed, and there was a really, really heavy army and police presence everywhere on the streets. So these weren't particularly usual things to see for a kid who'd been brought up in Hampshire. <laughs> but the other thing that I did see that evening, and the thing that really stood with me more than anything else, was the sight of a group of small kids who were playing football in a small patch of land between the busy lanes of a dual carriageway. <laughs> now that didn't seem to be a particularly sensible or safe place to play football. <laughs> But then, Colombia isn't a particularly sensible place, and it's not that safe either, so it's part of the course. This wasn't an unusual sight, though. Everywhere we went in the, in the kind of weeks and months and years that we stayed in Colombia, you would see people playing football. Any, everyone, anywhere, they'd be playing football. And for me, too, it was a way in. Um, you know, I started playing football with my friends at school. Uh, it really helped make friends. I was the headmaster's son. You needed a way in. Um, <laughs> It was also a way of learning the language. And some of the, the crucial words I learned in those first few weeks were Iquaputa and Weon. And those words were learned almost always after someone had missed an open goal, after a particularly <laughs> bad tackle. Uh, so I probably won't tell you what they mean if you don't mind. Um, the TV and radio, I used to watch them listen to football all the time. It was a great way of learning the language. I could tell you that sh what shampoo brand sponsored corner kicks. I could tell you that Café Rojo was by far the most successful cafe, uh, coffee in Colombia. And I could tell you that every Colombian commentator could go, GOAL! For a lot longer than I'm going to bother doing tonight. <laughs> but football, more importantly, was a way of normalising the things that surrounded us. Everywhere in the papers was violence, kidnapping, bombings, those kind of things. And for Colombians too, it was a way of coming to terms and normalising some of the trauma of their day-to-day -day existence. And it was made a lot easier by the fact that for the first time in 28 years, the Colombian football team qualified for the World Cup Finals in 1990. They did pretty well. They drew 1-1 with West Germany. They got knocked in the second round, but it had been a good tournament. And the team grew and grew. It was a golden generation. And three years later, in September the 5th, 1993, the Colombian national team thrashed Football powerhouses Argentina 5-0 in Buenos Aires. To give, you an, to give you an idea of just what this means, the world-famous novelist, Nobel Prize-winning author, Gabriel Garcia Marquez said it was one of the three most important things that happened in Colombia's entire history. <laughs> the Colombian people thought it was quite good too. They went completely <laughs> bonkers, utterly bonkers. That night, it was impossible to sleep. There was cumbia music, salsa music being blared out at all hours. The cars honking their horns, there were fireworks going off. It might have been gunshots, you were never really sure. Uh, but they celebrated madly. Only 83 people died. The president was no fool. He realised this was a big moment. He proclaimed the football team as heroes to the country. They were showing a new face of what Colombia could be. Players like Carlos Valderrama, Faustino Asprilla, El Tren Valencia showed the fun, the festivity of what Colombia really was. Colombia finally started to dream of something better through their football team. And they came together as a nation, thinking that it could show the, the world something other than drugs and violence. Even Pelé thought they had a chance to win the World Cup. But after two matches of the World Cup, they lost 2-1 against the host USA, 
and that was it. Rumours of drug cartels threatening the players, the managers, uh, of betting syndicates came out in the Colombian press. And two weeks later, the unfortunate central defender, Andres Escobar, who had scored an own goal that led to Colombia losing that match, was murdered in the car park of a nightclub in Medellin. It seemed that Colombian football couldn't escape the violence that the, Colum that the country was famous for. Around that time, 1994, my family left Colombia. I didn't think I'd be back. I taught Spanish for 15 years, uh, and then I decided on a change of, change of career plans. I decided to come back to Sheffield, do a master's in Latin American studies, and I found out that you could study football. Uh, so all this random knowledge suddenly became useful. And my thesis basically looks at how the current president, Juan Manuel Santos, is using football to construct the nation. Basically how football is being used to bring the country together. And what makes it different this time is that it's not just through speeches. There are campaigns, there are laws, there are concrete projects that are going on that use football to try and construct peace in the country. Again, there is a successful Colombian football generation. They did extremely well in the, in the 2014 World Cup in Brazil, got to the quarterfinals. They'll be in Russia this year as well. But another sign of just how important is for the country this time round is that it's on the back of the peace talks with the FARC guerrillas, a conflict that's been going on between the Colombian military and the guerrillas for over 60 years. During the World Cup in 2014, the president, Juan Manuel Santos, and the FARC leaders, when they were at the chats of the negotiations in the Havana, were wearing the Colombian football shirt. And on the back of the shirt, on the collar, there is a hashtag that says, Unidos por un país, united for a country. So it seems symbolic that both the politicians and the FARC were wearing the same shirt, much as every other Colombian was doing. And it's not just in symbolic ways that the FARC are being reintegrated through football. In the demobilization camps around the country, Football is being played between the ex-combatants, police, the army, the local civilians, in very public matches to create a new bridge between nations that were at war. It seems that instead of shooting bullets at each other, they're finally shooting balls instead. So Colombia's still playing football all the time, but this time they're playing it for peace. And in fact, there is a methodology for football for the peace that's being employed. It was created in Medellin, around about just after Andres Escobar, the central defender, had been murdered. And it teaches Colombian children, boys and girls, about conflict resolution, about health, about gender equality, about how not to be involved in the problems that's faced Colombia for so long. And this is the kind of thing that I wanted, wanted to go to Colombia to find out about, when I finally went back after 25 years in October last year. After three days of being in Colombia, I was invited to go to the project of a NGO called Tiempo de Juego, Time to Play. They use football, uh, this methodology of football for peace, in various camps across the country. And I was invited to go and see one in Soacha. Now, this was a little bit worrying for me. Soacha has uh, one of the worst murder rates in the country. It's in the top ten. Uh, and this would be very different for me, you know, when I lived there before I was in a very nice affluent part of Cali in a kind of condominium with an armed guard outside it. So going to somewhere like this, a microcosm of the problems that Colombia's had, a place that Colombians displaced by the conflict have gone to, a place of poverty, of gang recruitment, of drugs, of prostitution, this presented some ethical questions. Should I let my supervisor know I was going? <laughs> Should I tell friends? Should I tell my mum? <laughs> I decided to go, and as I walked up the, the, the kind of the hill towards the place where the football project uh, was carried out, I saw a lot of the problems that Soacha has. The buildings are very ramshackle, the roads aren't kind of particularly proper, the sewage isn't there. You can see the precariousness of the existence. And when I got to the top of the hill where the football project was, there was an even worse site up there as well. Amongst the kids playing football, there were at least three of them that were wearing Manchester United shirts. <laughs> <sighs> Terrible moment. The young man who was showing us around the, uh, the, the project, a guy called David Osorio, uh, told us all about it, and I had a chance to interview him afterwards. He was 24 years old, and he'd been born shortly after Andres Escobar had been murdered, and around the same time I'd left the country. His life was kind of like the same as many other Colombians. 
Uh, he was born in a small village called Son Son in Antioquia, which is right in the epicenter of the Colombian conflict. There, the army had fought the FARC and the paramilitaries. His father had been murdered by the FARC when he was one. When he was growing up, he realised that some of the older kids in his town just weren't there anymore. They disappeared, and he never knew why. At 12, he found out when the FARC tried to recruit him to join their ranks. He decided on something different. He didn't want to be part of the conflict. He had different dreams. And he fled, he fled Son Son and, and ran away to, uh, to Bogota. And he told me that he didn't know what many of his friends had done. He had no idea what had happened to them. He hoped for new opportunities, but Sawatcha didn't provide them. There, were no, there was no real education, there was no real security. And he fell into a drug habit. He would join one of the gangs. And he told me really frankly that it had been really easy for him to become just another sicario, an assassin living fast and dying young. But then football came. A group of uh, university students, led by uh, Andres Viesner, started up a football for peace organization in Soacha. And David and 25 or so of his friends decided to go along. Everyone likes football in Colombia. They started to play. Other kids from the neighborhood began joining. And instead of stabbing each other, they were kicking each other instead. <laughs> Probably a little bit better. <laughs> David became a monitor. He helped out with the coaching sessions. He became a community leader. And he's risen to the role of being a project leader for Tiempo de Juego. He's been sponsored by Adidas to go and teach about football for peace in Spain and the Czech Republic. His dream now is to become a professional football coach. It was amazing to see David at work. He was, passing, he was passing footballs with the kids in the project and passing on his life experiences. They were scoring goals and gaining new goals for life. And during that session, where I saw David at work first with a group of kids and then with a group of former guerrillas, victims and paramilitaries who'd been involved with the conflict, it was so obvious just what power football has in Colombia. And I heard that day a phrase that I heard in every single interview I did, whether it was with politicians, academics, football fans, the, the leader of sport for the FARC, sports monitors in the camps where the FARC were demobilizing. I heard the same phrase over and over again. Football is the only thing that can unite us. Thank you.